For more than a decade, FTI has strived to become the leader in the aftermarket, performance, transmission, and converter industry. We've joined forces with McLeod Driveline Components under the leadership of Top Fuel Funny Car Pilot Paul Lee, and now have a larger distribution network, more resources, and more power. Come see us in the pits and ask how you can join the FTI family. It's not cheating. It is the competitive edge. It's time for an inside look at the most powerful motorsport on the planet. WFO Radio, NHRA Nitro. This is WFO Radio. Hey, everybody. WFO Radio. We are back. We got our funny car winner, Matt Hagen, going to be joining us just seconds from now. I want to tell everybody, though, up front and honest, this is a pre record show because I am on my way to Phoenix, Arizona for the NHRA Arizona Nationals. Just want to mention the folks at Total Seal and FTI, Foggett, Bernie's, Phillips Connect, all on board with WFO Radio, Marvin Rodak, of course, Rodak's Coffee and Grills.com, Sam Tech, and Frank Hawley's. I'll tell you about them in detail later. But we have got the funny car winner from the Emily Motor Oil NHRA Gator Nationals joining us now, Matt Hulk Hagen. What's up, Matt? How are you? Hey, Joe. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, buddy. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that you're on. One for one, right? And back to back at the Gator Nationals. That's a pretty good way to start the season. Uh, I don't want to say you made it look easy, but, you know, it was Dickie's birthday. There was a lot going on, and you won it. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I was tickled to pull down their first win for TSR this season. It kind of kind of takes some pressure off a little bit. And, um, you know, it just, you know, you want to get that first one out of the way, you know, and then you feel like you can kind of get into a stride with things. But, you know, I just did a, an interview with Brian Loans on uh, this Too Fast, Too Tasty deal. And, you know, coming into this, um, you know, qualifying deal that we we're going to get to run for 10 grand and, you know, all this other stuff. It's just uh, you have to be humble, man. I think that these cars, you know, I'd love to sit here and pound on my chest and say, you know, we got to figure it figured out and we're going to do great and all that kind of stuff. But these cars have a way of humbling you. They, you think, you you know, you, you got it figured out and things are going good. And then, you um, you know, you unload it out of the trailer and it just won't race and then it won't go down the racetrack or something. So, um, you know, I think that I have to be realistic with what we have a brand new race car. We're still trying to figure out primary on the car where we need to be as far as it leaving the starting line. There's, uh, you know, we got some different things in the fuel curve that we're working on um, and just the drivability of the car. I mean, this car is uh, brand new, you know, and it's 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 built around me. But, you know, everything in my area this this last weekend was different. You know, my clutch throw was different. Um, you know, I was having a hard time holding the clutch in. Um, I feel like Dickie's addressed that and we're going to get that fixed for this race. But my leg was shaking every round and trying to hold my leg in with my hand. And, you know, uh, you know, a lot of stuff going on. My, my steering box is different. My, you know, uh, fuel pedal. I mean, I, I, you know, we're working on getting a heel cup for my fuel pedal and different things like that. So, um there's a lot going on in there that a lot of stuff behind the scenes that people don't don't realize, you know, and uh, I have the best crew in the world. And I know that when something comes up and I have an issue that needs to be addressed, uh, they do so in a timely manner. And so growing into Phoenix, I, I feel like, you know, we're working towards a lot of things in my department. But I also know that we're working towards a lot of things in Dickie's department with with the motor and the clutch and the tune up and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, so I think there's still a learning curve with with this new chassis. Uh, the, the the guys at PBR race cars, they um, they did a great job putting a car underneath me. And, you know, uh, JR has got one just like mine. And those two cars were in the final. And I think that speaks for itself, you know. But um, but like I said, it's just the first of the year. And it usually takes two or three races to kind of get a lot of stuff ironed out and fuel curves and all that kind of stuff. So as much as I would like to be like, yeah, we, you know, we're doing great and we got this figured out. I think that you have to be humble with it and understand your situation and, and really come into it still kind of learning, I think a little bit. So um, Dickie did a great job on Sunday of, you know, we qualified fifth and um, you know, I felt good about going into Sunday, but you know, you're not like, oh, we're one, two or three up there and we feel really good about this, you know? So he did a great job racing the racetrack, uh, keeping lane choice and, um, you know, it just, it was, it was one of those things where he got it all together on Sunday and I just didn't mess it up. You know what I mean? So it was, uh, it was good. You know, it was a good start to the year. Uh, Tony was real happy. Leah did really well. She went to the semifinals. 
Um, so overall for, you know, Tony always says one team, all team, you know, and, and for, for our team as a, as a group, we had a really successful weekend. I felt like Leah felt like she was happy. Uh, Tony was happy, obviously Dickie's birthday. Um, you know, it just, just was one of those weekends that just kind of came together and really worked for us. Very interesting. For the way you're talking, it's not like a racer who just won the first race of the year, right? Like you got big things going. Does a lot of that stem from last year's countdown? Cause you're real strong. The first two thirds of the season, you're real strong. I mean, when Western swing kind of went sideways, but then when the chips were down in the countdown, I know you would have liked to have performed better and been mixing it up for the championship. Is that motivating you in this moment? Like you mentioned the chassis builder that you got a different chassis, a new chassis, that kind of stuff. Um, to see the way it went in the playoffs, a couple of things go different. Maybe the season ends differently. It sounds like you're motivated by that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, every point matters, every qualifying point matters. And to come out and have that that cushion to go in, you know, at the countdown when they reset the points, number one, I think I've only had that once or twice in my career, you know. So you're always kind of coming from behind and trying to chase down the, the deal, you know. So, uh, you know, it's it's real important, you know, to to take every qualifying session and every point and, and make sure that you're uh, you're scooping those up because I've seen championships lost by two, two points, you know, at the end of the day. And, and yeah, you know, last year definitely didn't end the way I wanted it to. Um, you know, it, it was just tough because, you know, my assistant crew chief and car chief, they kind of make the calls on the racetrack. And, you know, we hadn't been down the people, you know, I had fans reach out and be like, why did you pick the left lane? And it wasn't favored and nobody was getting down it. But in qualifying, we hadn't, you know, uh, been down the right lane. And to go up there, uh, to go down a lane that you've smoked the tires in, uh, in twice and, and pick that for first round is tough. And, you know, I almost keyed up and was like, hey, guys, are you sure about this left lane? But, you know, you sometimes you learn, like, to keep your mouth shut. You know what I mean? So it's just, like, such a tough decision, you know. And, and we had the shot at it to, to really win the thing, um, you know, because Robert went out early and then Caps was there. And, and if we would have just got through that first round, I feel like we would have still been in the thick of it, you know, for the majority of the day. So it, it just really, really tough that it ended that way that we, we, you know, didn't get down the lane that we picked and we had lane choice and, um, you know, just very disheartening. But at the end of the day, you know, we all learn as, as a group, you know, my assistant crew chief and my car chief, I'm sure they learned a lot from that. No different than if I go out there and I drive it out of the groove and we lose the round, you know what I mean? Like you learn from it, man. You can't harp on it. You just got to go, man. Like, you know, what could we have done different or could we really got down the right lane and different things like that? So it does drive you at the end of the year, you know, to, to kind of, you know, come back and, and work hard. And, you know, two of, of the three championships I've won, I've run it up the year before. And, you know, that's a, that's an awful feeling to run it up, you know, to be that close and to, to have it in your grasp. And then it just gets ripped away from you, you know? So um, you put that in perspective and you just really, you know, you, you dig deep. And I think that we're all hungry out here. We all have, our own goals. We all have our, our different things that we set for ourselves for the season. And, uh, you know, for me, it's just kind of, I have my, my goals is there's no reason we can't go out here and win eight or nine races like Robert did last year. I mean, we we're that good. You know, I feel like a lot of days we're better than them. And, and it's just one of those things where we won four races and I just, I wasn't happy with that. Like, I mean, that's kind of our standard average, you know, kind of four or five races, but I just know that we're we're better than that. And you touched on it earlier. I think, you know, when it gets hot, we fall off. But I think a lot of that is, you know, Dickie is very aggressive tuner, you know, and and it's it's super hard to pull these cars back. You know, I mean, when it's cool and we're running great, Dickie, man, like dude, that guy is just unbelievable how fast he can make these cars run. And I think that's why we do so well in the beginning of the season and in the countdown when it really counts, you know, but you know, what I saw with Robert this year or last year is they didn't fall off in the heat. You know, they had a fast, consistent race car all season long and was talking, you know, I've been talking to my crew chief and my assistant crew chief about that. You know I mean? Taking this thing over here to Indy or across the road and dragging it, dragging it over there when it gets hot and getting a tune up from, you know, four, you know three, three ninety five to four Oh five. You know what I mean? Just something that'll go down a dirt road when it gets hot. And it's very, we're very capable of doing it. I'm probably capable of doing it without even to, like testing it. But, but at the end of the day, you know, we got to start doing that kind of stuff to, you know, when it gets hot, when the, the Western swing starts and when, you know, that's, that's kind of our typical when we fall off every year. And, and um, you know, you just, it's, it's not that we're doing anything wrong. We're just, you know, we're aggressive car. We run really well and, and it's hard to pull these cars back when they're fast. But I think that, you know, if we're going to win eight or nine races this year, 
we have to be successful in the heat as well. And, uh, you know, and we all know that, you know, it's nothing that, that we're, you know, I'm not pointing out anything that anybody doesn't see or already know. I just think that that's some stuff that we can work on. And, and um, you know, I, I, I feel like we'll be competitive all year. I just, I'm excited because, you know, I've been so, together so long with Dickie and, you know, he, we kind of know each other, just our tendencies and what we're doing. And, um, you know, I guess it's been 11 or 12 years with the guy and, and that's kind of unheard of out here, you know, because people bounce around so much and, but, you know, I truly respect Dickie Venables. I, I look up to him and he impresses me every weekend that we work together. There's not a weekend that goes by that something that he doesn't do on that race car or something that he doesn't figure out that doesn't impress me. I mean, I just truly, you know, am glad that he's in my corner. You know what I mean? The guy is just a brilliant guy and I wouldn't trade him for anyone out here. I mean, I know, you know, caps, they won two back-to-back crew chief, uh, championships and stuff like that, but I mean, at the end of the day, man, like I, I, I picked Dickie, you know I mean? Obviously I'm a little biased because he is my crew chief, but, but I just hand to hand, man. I just, I feel like, you know, a lot of stuff plays into luck and I just feel like Dickie's a better racer on Sundays and we, we go more rounds and we have that kind of stuff. And the countdown changes a lot of stuff. Robert would have run away with it last year, but, you know, consistently year after year, you know, we were in the thick of it. I mean, I got drive named driver of the decade by auto week. And it was because our consistency in the championships and the round wins and that kind of stuff. So, you know, that was when the new decade started or the old one ended, but, but that just shows you how consistent he is as a racer. So that's what I'm proud of with him, man. And that's why I'm so glad, you know, to have him in my corner and wouldn't trade him for anybody. I am detecting, and you tell me, um, a little bit of urgency that's different at the start of 23 than I have sensed before speaking with caps at Gainesville at the test, he, he was a little, you know, on the edge as a champ. He didn't like, you know, Robert winning all those races and people had suggested that the countdown was bad and caps is like, Hey man, I've felt the pain too. And there's just like an urgency around everybody, like feeling that your team is great and you should be winning championships, but so is his. And so is Roberts and Jr. has got the program going in the right direction because funny car has never been tougher than it is right now. And I just, I don't know. I'm sensing all this. Maybe, you know, you describe it. Maybe if I'm right, nervous energy coming out of everybody, because they know that now is the time and they've got what it takes to win. Yeah. you know, I think it's just, you know, start of the year, get a couple laps under you, get a couple races behind you. I mean, like I said earlier, I think it takes two or three races to kind of get your combination sorted out and get feeling comfortable in the car. I mean, we tested for a few days there in Gainesville and I felt really good about it, you know, and it just, it, it, for, for me though, it's like, if you can come out of the gate running, you know, you just never look back, you know, and, and that, that chasing feeling is always just kind of, it, it sucks. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how else other to say that, but it's just, it's, it's not, it's not a feeling that you, you like having you, you know, I, I want to be the guy that people are chasing, you know what I mean? And it's just, I know we're capable of that. And I know we have the team around us and the group of guys and the parts and the pieces that Tony supplies us with to, to, uh, to be out there and running front and running away with this thing. So, um, you know, I, I do have a lot of confidence in everything that we're doing. And, and, um, you know, I just think that it's just a matter of, you know, sometimes just implementing, you know, some of the stuff that we've been working on and, and taking some chances here and there, but, but also just, like I said, being a good racer on Sunday. And I think that's what Dickie is. You know I mean? We went up there in the final round and, you know, probably had the conditions to be set up like first round, but they set it up like second round. And, and, and that says a lot, you know, because, you know, as much as you want to rotate the earth and go out there and, and run a big number in the final, it's like, you got to play it smart. Let's go down this racetrack. And, you know, I mean, you saw JR smoke the tires in the final and, and that's the difference. You know what I mean? Just racing on Sunday and being a good racer. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let's get into that a little bit because you got a rematch against Alexis. And this is the first time that we're doing this and it's a new program and there's extra money, but there's also championship points. Uh, Mike Salinas told us yesterday that uh, he liked the idea of side wagers on these runs for entertainment purposes, just like have fun with it. Uh, wh what is your take on this program? It's important mission foods, providing money, NHRA providing points, but it's really to create a spectacle. It's also designed to create maybe a little friction. Like you got to run this person again. Now you're going to run Alexis. If you beat her again, that's definitely going to annoy her, right? Like nobody likes to get beaten and this race matters. 
So just give us your overview on this program, Too Fast, Too Tasty, and how are you going to handle it? Yeah, I think, first of all, I'll say thank you to NHRA and, and the uh, Too Fast, Too Tasty program there. I mean, to set up that kind of bonus money for my guys is huge. I mean, it, it could be, you know, $500 a piece to them. And, you know, that's a car payment to some, you know, some of those guys and stuff. And so it's huge. I mean, my guys were already talking about it when we hit the semis and we're like, we get to run for some more money. And, um, you know, so I, I think that the program is amazing, you know, but it also makes me feel like we're kind of back to where we had those two qualifiers, you know, and the first one always has to count, you know, to kind of to go down the racetrack. And, and when you do that, you know, I mean, you, you take Saturday and you pretty much throw it away sometimes because you're racing, you know what I mean? And you're pushing hard and you, you want to win that money. Um, I think having 16 cars, um, you know, in Phoenix will, will help, you know, a lot of people be, I guess, a little bit less leery of that. But at the end of the day, you know, when he turns that knob and, and, you know, walks away, that's my race car. And I got to decide what I'm going to do with it. You know what I mean? And, and it's just, um, it puts things in different perspective. It changes the game, you know, in qualifying into a race and we are all competitive when we all want to win, you know? So, uh, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, it's going to be huge to get that first round on Friday and get a good solid round and go down the racetrack and get a baseline so that you're not going up there Saturday, throwing a dart, or, you know, you're just kind of chasing it all weekend to kind of get your, your baseline for Sunday. And, um, and that, you know, don't get me wrong. We, you know, the, the money and the bonus and all that kind of stuff is great, but we still have to win a race for our sponsor. And they, they have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in the weekend and the race. And so I think you have to still keep big picture in mind and what you're doing in qualifying, because, you know, back when we used to have with COVID, the, you know, like when the year 2020, when I won the championship, you know, we had two rounds a lot of times and it's like, here you go, you know, you got one shot at it. And if not, you're outside looking in and, and you got to go down the racetrack and then you're in the back of the pack and you got a hard car on Sunday morning and it just sets itself up for, you know, to be either really, really good or really, really disastrous, you know? And so I think you have to keep some of that in perspective, but that ain't really my job, man. I mean, I, I try not to think too much up there, you know, less is more. And, you know, I get in there and I, I leave on time and keep it in the groove and try to turn the wind light on and to keep it that simple, man. What about uh, the boss man? Tony is now a more experienced racer. He had that great outing in Vegas. He's run the baby Gators. He's running a, a lot more often now. Um, you know, you give him pointers. Do you talk to him? Do you, I know you try to pump him up and I know you're trying to get him in a funny car, but uh, explain that relationship driver to driver. Yeah. I mean, I think it's you, as much as you want to run over there and say, Hey man, you know, do this or do that. It's just, it's kind of like Tim Wilkerson told me, you know, when I first get my license, it's like, bud, I was like, you know, do you have any, any pointers for me or what do you think? And he's like, at 300 miles an hour, you're pretty much on your own. You're going to figure it out or you're not, you know, and, and we all learn from our mistakes, you know what I mean? And, uh, and you have to make those mistakes to, to grow. You know what I mean? That's the only way you do grow is to challenge yourself and put yourself in uncomfortable situations and, and make mistakes, you know, and it, but he makes you a better driver and, and Tony's a driver, man. So he doesn't really need any pointers from anybody. And, you know, if anything, that would just be kind of chatter in his ear, I think, you know, I mean, he's been to Frank Holly's school. He was just there on Friday and running an alcohol funny car. And his dad was in a comp car and they're just, he's just trying it all out, man. And I just, I just think that's great. You know what I mean? Just figure out what you like and, and decide, you know, a direction and, and jump all over it. But, you know, I mean, the thing about Tony is just, he's very methodical and he's, he's pumped up about this and he's at our races every weekend and he could be anywhere. You know what I mean? He could be at his cup deal. He could be wherever, you know what I mean? Uh, some of his racetracks he owns, all that kind of stuff, but he's here at the NHRA and you know, he's, he's being competitive and he's watching his wife and he's supporting our team. And, you know, so it, I think it says a lot about how excited this guy is about our sport. And, and that's huge, you know, is this is, something that NHRA has needed for a long time and uh you know at least in my career anyway and and we we finally have a guy out here that's you know very well recognized very well respected and and has put a team together and is supporting the NHRA and and bringing in new sponsors and different things like that so I just can't say enough about you know Tony not just because he you know pay, you know pays my paycheck but just because of the guy that he is man I mean I just have a lot of respect for him you know and just He's just a dude too that after you win, you just want to go hang out with him and drink a beer, you know? So it's just kind of, it's kind of one of those things where it's a really cool dynamic to have him as my boss, but, but also just kind of have him as a friend. Yeah. Well, I think that that crowd that we experienced 
which you've been to the Gators. It's always big, right? But this one was particularly massive. And I think that Tony doing a lot of those media days, bringing in some NASCAR fans who don't know what drag racing is. Those people exist. I think he was, uh, there was a Stewart effect in play at the Gator Nationals somewhat. You know, it was massive to see it sold out. You know what I mean? Come in Saturday. I waited for three hours in a car to get in and I was just like, man, they're going to have to send a scooter out here to get me because it's just, we're not going nowhere. And, um, you know, just, but I love that, you know, as much as I was like anxious and had anxiety to get in there to warm my car up and try to be on time and all this stuff, it just uh, never would have dreamed that I had to leave three hours early to try to make it to the racetrack to warm my car up to be there two hours early before we run. And, and it just, it's like you're biting your nails, you don't know what to do, but how about, you know, the fans that poured in there and, you know, by the groves and just supported what we did and was excited to, to have some racing back out there, you know, kick off the season. I mean, it just to do the burnout, you know, like I said, it, it gives me chill bumps to look at, look back when I'm in reverse and backing up and, you know, kind of looking around a little bit and, and see all those folks out there. I mean, it's, it's really awesome. And, you know, like Tony said, you know, you know, it, Watching it on TV is great, but that doesn't help the sport. You know, you got to come out and, and buy a ticket and support the the cause and and just, you know, be be a part of it, you know, and, and that's how our sport grows. Yeah, I, you know, he said something like that on this show, and I'm, I put the clip out there on social media, and I was really surprised that I got pushback from anyone. That seems like such a non-controversial thing to say, except, man, people were pushing back. Oh, don't tell me what to do, Tony. Just craziness. We're going to have a big one this weekend as well. Final race at Arizona. I hope not. Hope for a miracle. But we're going to have another big crowd, some people that are going to get off their butt and go to the track. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously you want to win the last one there to put your, you know, kind of name in the history books if it is to be able to win the last one. But, man, what a bummer. You know, I just – I really like Phoenix. I really like the Scottsdale area. I mean, that's one place that I probably would like to buy a winter home, you know, and as I get older and my bones start aching more, you know, just a, a place to hang out. It's just super clean. It's super nice. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to worry about, you know, a bunch of riffraff or feeling safe. And it just – I just really enjoy testing out there and, and racing out there. I've won that race a bunch. Um, you know, I just have a, a lot of good stuff to say about that track. And, you know, it was just, it, it really bummed me out when I heard that it might be our last race there this year. So we're going to make the best of it and, and make it as special as possible. But like I said, you, you know, you, you pour nitro in the tank and that's, you know, you never know what you're going to get. That's why these cars are so humbling. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why like you, you were, you worked with a little trash talk early on, maybe 10 years ago, and it was just tough to get going, right? Because these cars, like, they don't always do what you tell them. Dickie says it. He told me once. He goes, it's a miracle. It goes down the track ever. Once it's a miracle, <laughs> let alone four times in a row ahead of the competition. Matt, great job. Appreciate you coming on WFO Radio. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I like the car, by the way. I like the new uh, Sublime it line. It, it's a, it yeah, pops. that direct connection, man. Like, you know, uh, when they, they put it on paper, I was just like, I don't know, man. I, I don't know how it's going to look in person. But, man, when we did the photo shoot and you turn the lights off and it glows in the dark and it's just kind of like it, it pops on the racetrack. I mean, Mark Whitney with Dodge, he killed it, you know, as far as figuring that out and coming out with that. And, you know, this direct connection car is just it, it, it just you can't miss it. So if uh, <laughs> you're looking out there in the racetrack and you see see some green stuff, you know, that's us. But, you know, there's a lot of green cars out there this year. So maybe it's a little bit of a, a trend or whatever. But, you know, the old saying of, uh, you, you know, green's not lucky, you know. Um, I was kind of thinking about that. And then I was like, nah, Force's car is green. And gosh, he's got 16 championships. So um, I, I think that puts that to rest. You know what I mean? But but I, I, I'm just excited. The car looks good. It's running good. Um, you know, I can't wait to see all the fans in Phoenix and just kind of get out there, sign some autographs, get down the racetrack, get qualified good, and then get to race on Saturday and Sunday. So, uh, you know, that that's a racer's dream, man. Like competition is what we live for. And it used to be for me, like driving the car at 330 miles an hour. But really, when you, you stage those two cars up and that tree falls, it's, that's what it's all about, you know, and, and getting it to the finish line first. So um, I'm pumped up about it. You know, I can't wait to get on a plane tomorrow and head out there. We got some, some stuff that we got to shoot for our new sponsor, Renai. Um, they want some B-roll and some TV stuff. And I'm, I'm excited to do that for them and uh, kill a day at the racetrack in some warm weather. And, and uh, then we get this, this direct connection dodge, hopefully in the winter circle again this weekend. 
Excellent. Another one of those new sponsors, by the way. What is that? That's tankless water heaters, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got them in my house already. So I'm just kind of like looking for our, our discount code so I can get a few more. You know, it's just one of those <laughs> things. I, I got people coming up to me all the time. They're like, hey, uh, what's the discount code? And we we don't have one yet. We're going to get one. But like I can name probably 10 people right now that, that like want to buy one, you know, and it's well, just kind of it- like, well, hook me up. It was one of those technologies where I think everybody was like, does that work? Am I going to? And it, from what I understand, I have a friend who has one and it works, works like it works better. Yeah. works, which. Yeah. You can leave the water running and never have to worry about it running out. You know what I mean? So That's take amazing. those long showers with that stuff. I love it. I love it. See, look at that. We're doing market research for people and help them out with their uh, with their water heater deal. Matt, thank you very much. Congratulations on the win. I know we're going to be talking a lot this year. Good luck. Have fun. And I'll see you out in Arizona. Thank you, Joe. Be safe getting out there, buddy. Likewise, you too. Be good. There he goes, Matt Hagan with us here on WFO Radio. How about that? Your funny car winner from the Emily Motor Oil NHRA Gator Nationals. A lot going on there. A lot of information. Rapid fire. Hagan gives you a lot of information. You got to dig in there. You got to think about it. Like you mentioned, the chassis, changing a lot of different things, uh, the way he sits in the car, getting it right, all of those things last year. You know, big moments. That's what the countdown does. It puts the microscope on certain moments. We could probably go back and analyze every single run and think about how it affected everything. But that's in the past. And right now we are looking ahead to 2023 in the Arizona Nationals, followed by Pomona, the Lucas Oil Winter Nationals at In-N-Out Burger Drag Strip. Right. And hopefully we get some great weather out there. Speaking with uh, Mike Salinas the other day. Mike says not looking good weather-wise. Uh, I know we're going to have great weather because it never rains in Southern California. But does it snow? That will be a little weird. No, it's going to be good stuff. Going to be good stuff. All right, let me tell you about the people who make it possible. I mentioned at the very beginning of this show, it's a pre record show, but I do have some vital information that I'm going to share to make it worth your while. We're going to tell you a little bit about Project Pontiac. The whole take, like what is it? concept of project pontiac a lot of people have been asking me i'm going to tell you that as well uh troy coughlin going to be joining us on thursday right this is airing on wednesday this is on thursday many of the people that watch the show probably most of them don't give uh, a care about what day i say it is because they're watching in the distant future if that's you subscribe click the bell this is a we present it in in, in a time order right after the event as best as we can uh in real time It's a serial show. You go through a season of WFO, just like you go through a season of regular drag racing or a season of football. You go through the season. It's the real life NHRA version of Drive to Survive. They tell us what's happening behind the scenes, the ins, the outs, the what have yous. All happens on WFO. You can get the gist, the emotion, the up, the down from watching the show. So subscribe, click the bell. Here are the people who make it possible. Fog it. F-O-G-G-I-T. This is for bracket racers, sportsman racers, people who want to protect the inside of their very valuable racing engine. It is a high-performance fogging oil. At the end of the day of racing, you pull that coil wire, you spin the starter, you spray it down into the cylinders, and you protect them from rust, from condensation, from corrosion. You've spent so much money to achieve that surface. You can't just let cold, misty air go up your uh, header and through the open exhaust valve and into the cylinder. That's bad. So go to Fog It. Get on board with the contingency program, F-O-G-G-I-T. And yes, we're going to have Steve and Gary on the show to give us an informative uh, interaction about Fog It. FTI performance transmissions and torque converters. These guys are doing a great job for the big money bracket guys, the 890 guys, the pro mod guys, the top sportsman guys, and the top dragster guys. Just look around for the FTI performance decals and you will see big power and consistency is achieved with FTI performance transmissions and torque converters. Total Seal Piston Rings, we're going to be at Total Seal next week at some point. Going to be doing shows from Total Seal, a hidden horsepower episode, a WFO radio episode. I'm going to be all off and confused on time, but we're going to try to do it at the, uh, I'm going to have to get there bright and early, aren't I? I'm going to have to be there like first thing in the morning. That's not cool. Totalseal.com. Go to their website when it comes to ring seal. This is the no brainer. 
Just look around. Who is it? Is it Pat Musi? Is it Greg Anderson? Whichever team you're thinking about, they're all using total seal. Matt Smith, they're all using total seal. Why? Superior technology, research and development, and they're on the absolute cutting edge of figuring out what works for different applications inside that cylinder wall. Are you running methanol? Well, your cylinder needs to be different than if you're running alcohol. Uh, then you're running gasoline, excuse me, because methanol and alcohol are the same thing. Go to TotalSeal.com to find out more information. Make them your first call, not your last call. But this is what I intend to do. I'm going to build 555, then I'm going to run on the street, occasionally bracket race. It's going to run on gas. Those are the questions. This is what you should consider. And they can even put you together with machine shops. They sell tools. They sell profilometers. They got the new software that visualizes all the RPK uh, numbers. Check them out, totalseal.com. Phillips-Connect, this is Justin Ashley and his team. It's really about the trucking and transportation industry, keeping you safe, keeping you on time, keeping your load safe, keeping your, uh, your truck safe with connected technology, whether it be lights or bearings or weight, all of these things. Making sure your air tanks are full, they keep connected so you don't have any kind of issue. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's what Phillips hyphen connect is all about. And if you'd like a personalized introduction, just email me Joe at WFO radio.com. Bernie speed shop. We were down there. I got to experience Bernie's Josh Hart's over a 100,000 square foot hot rod shop. American classic horsepower. There's a body shop. There's an engine shop. They do frame off restorations. It's got a whole army of people working there. They buy, they sell on consignment bernies.com check them out samtech.edu i've really been getting into the samtech deal over the past couple of weeks because i've spent a lot of time with engine builders and i'm also really uh into the idea of building america right like what made america successful in the first place well our first class infrastructure and the highway system that's where hot rodding came from that's where the car hops came from like people getting out on the roads and doing all that right People built that. It was built by people with capabilities. And we need those people in our future. And graduates from Samtech are those people, whether it be learning how to program a CNC machine, learning how to crew a race car, learning how to do cylinder heads or an engine block or program uh, something for SpaceX. These are the skills that are taught at Samtech. Go, go to samtech.edu, call Brian Massengill, tell him you heard about it on WFO. Frank Hawley's Drag Racing School, more of a thrill, right? Did he say that Tony was at Frank Hawley's driving an alcohol funny car? I think that's what he said, which is, you know, Tony has always said that he is like mini claustrophobic, like me when I got in the MRI machine and I freaked out and I ran out of there. That he wasn't didn't want to be in a funny car. Doug Gordon lowered the body on me once in his funny car and I was like, oh. That would be super cool if I heard Matt correctly. Now, I will go back and listen again to make sure I got it right. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think I'm not. And his dad is running as well. Super cool. And you can do it as well. Drive a dragster in the dragster adventure. You and your friends get it as a gift. You and your husband. Your husband is not interested in your drag racing addiction. You want him to understand. And so you put him in a Frank Hawley dragster for the dragster adventure. Oh, I know there's a lot of guys out there that their girlfriends, they love drag racing. They're into it. They race. And the, the guy is like, uh, I don't know. Where was I just the other day? I heard that story. Some lady was telling, I was at the AERA conference. And she was tell, talking about how her husband didn't know the difference between a steering wheel and a tire and something like that. She wished that he had the same passion for cars that she did. She needs to send him to Frank Hawley's. FrankHawley.com. And then there's Marvin Rodak, RodaksCoffeeAndGrills.com. This is just simple. Best coffee in the world. Hot sauces, spice rubs, everything good. Tools, tips, information. Go to the website, Rodax, R-O-D-A-K-S, CoffeeAndGrills.com, or call them, 817-924-6821. Call Marvin. Get the WFO Radio Blend to start. That's the best blend to start off with, and that will begin your coffee journey. And then there's our Patreon listener group. These guys are VIPs, guys. Join for the year. I send you a t-shirt. You get stickers and patches to begin with. But most importantly, you get to be part of a great community. Like our listener, Patreon, Brit, 
has been talking about her bracket racing. She came out to our big Vegas meetup and she just won her first race. And what happened? Everybody rallied around her. They were super excited for her. We're going to be doing a Patreon meetup at the Stampede of Speed this year. And the Patreons, they get the Hear It From Heiner show. They get Monday Motivation. They're in on all the different plotting and planning that we do. Maybe that sounds interesting to you. You want to support WFO? Patreon.com slash WFO radio. There you go. And we got merch and all this kind of stuff. And I'm really just chilling for it, the stuff now. I'm just, I'm just, it's a total shill job, right? It's just a total shill job, Joe. But we got some cool stuff like the Miami Hollywood t-shirt. That's legend. All right. Too fast, too tasty challenge. You got Matt and Alexis. So I would say to be fair and, and the, the Vegas handicappers, they have such a difficult job. I wonder, do they get phone calls from people when they make one, the favorite over the other? But I, I think that Matt is a favorite over Alexis. But she's got a very quick and fast car running. The car is as fast as any other car out there. And she's coming in off a semifinal run, which she was driving well. And she's at a happy place. And that means a lot. She's at a racetrack that she got her first win. She's got two wins here. And so if Alexis beats Matt, I'm not shocked. But I do think that Paul Kagan coming in with the momentum from the Gator Nationals. You heard him. He's there's a sense of urgency. I think he's a slight favorite. Other side of the ladder. Chad Green, J.R. Todd. J.R. They worked during the offseason. I had a great conversation with Chad Head about it. And it's like, look. Last year was a terrible year. But we've worked very hard. We've got everybody back and we're turning the page and we're making things better. Well, and that's across all platforms at Coletta Motorsports. I think they showed what's up and that Coletta Motorsports is going to be a part of the conversation this year. Chad Green, I would say, is a slight underdog to J.R. Todd. And so we might have a rematch rematch of last week's final round. But we'll just have to wait and see. Now, don't get me wrong. My new favorite crew chief, Daniel Wilkerson, because he has no filter. And that's how I say it. My new favorite crew chief, Daniel Wilkerson, because he has no filter. Because he doesn't. And that's what I love. I love interviewing him. I love hearing Jason Galvin interview him. Because D Daniel Wilkerson is going to say something. He's going to tell you. He's just going to debrief what his brain is thinking out his mouth. And one of these times, it's definitely going to be very funny and insightful and informative like because he has got no filter. Don't develop a filter, Daniel. Don't do it. Your job is safe. I mean, I can't promise you that, but I, I like your interviews. And so there you go. That is going to do it. Appreciate you guys coming on board for this pre-recorded version. We're going to hear from Troy Coughlin Jr. later on in the week. This Mission Foods Too Fast, Too Tasty Challenge. This is the first one. We're definitely hyping it up a lot. I can see somebody saying, well, you know, it's getting more attention than the big race, but it's not. We just want everybody to understand what's going on, that it's significant. And when in drag racing, do you know that this one is definitely going to run that one? I think about all those Garlitz Muldowney commercials where they were going to have a match race and you knew they were going to race and they came to town and they had commercials. What do you think about this one? What do you think about that one? Because you knew they were going to race. We never get that on Sunday because it's qualifying. You just don't know what's going to happen with this mission foods deal. We can talk about, Hagen about Alexis. Like if I really wanted to go into it, we could have had their career numbers. We could have broke it down the, the last time they raced. All of these things. What were the reaction times? Average reaction time. We could go crazy with the stats, with the Mission Foods Too Fast, Too Tasty Challenge. That is what's interesting. That is what is intriguing. And to me, for wagering, 
we're ever going to have something to wager on in this sport other than, uh, you know, Robert Height three to one to win the race. This is this is it. You got, you know, got a week out or two, and you know who's going to run. So it's going to be very fun, and we're gonna we're gonna see it together. Speaking of which, I got to figure out exactly what we're going to do. All right, guys. WFO, remember Project Pontiac. More information coming out. Take an old bracket car, convert it to an NHRA competitive super street car. Can we do it? 